Hi, I'm Jeff Lawton. I'm a permaculture teacher, designer and consultant. I'm the managing director of Zaytuna Farm, which hosts the Permaculture Research Institute here in northern New South Wales, Australia. And here we address the problems of the world, the sustainability issues, the food security, water cycles. We demonstrate permaculture as an ethical design science and show people how they can live in a way that benefits the environment with renewable energy, natural biological waste systems, sensible housing, and of course, clean air, clean water, clean food, and all the systems we need to provide for ourselves in a way that will also benefit the environment instead of all the issues we have, all the issues of modern industrial life, we provide solutions and demonstrate how you can understand the design, implementation and establishment of those solutions on the ground with real action. We're doomed if we don't change our behaviour. Um, it looks like we're starting to. It looks like there's some, at last some concern and people are starting to pay attention to people who actually have achieved something and that we can prove. But if we don't change our behavior, yeah, we're doomed. We're absolutely doomed. Life as we know it is gonna change um, and it's not gonna be very nice. It's an incredibly serious situation now. We actually have major collapse happening. There's uh, all kinds of crises and they're, they're just stacking up one after another. Obviously there's a climate crisis and we're getting, going into a flood drought regime. There are finite fuel crisis, there's financial crisis, there's food security crisis, there's a soil erosion crisis and a water crisis and particularly polluted water and pollution itself. There are so many crises and the answer to all of these is the way we actually behave and the way we supply our needs. What we have to do is we have to design our way out of this problem all of these problems, we can design our way out of these problems because it's about aligning our actions to the natural system so that we become the most beneficial element on earth rather than the most damaging element. And that we can do, but we have to make that intention and we have to have a design plan. Permaculture has the design plan we need. Most people aren't addressing this problem seriously that we have. The issues that we are faced with globally are extremely serious and we have to come up with solutions very fast because there's all kinds of things happening. We're noticing climate change everywhere. We're noticing flood and drought regimes. It's a consequence of deforestation. It's a consequence of agriculture being bare soil agriculture, industrialized agriculture, running off water too quickly, running with its soils, creating a very big effect on the climate because there's more reflected heat, there's less absorption of energy with ecosystems. Ecosystems are the buffer of the massive amounts of energy coming into the world, into the earth from the sun. We know that we need to work with the natural systems to regulate and moderate that. That's what we can do, but we have to change our industrial approach. You can't have an industrial approach to nature. Nature just ridicules you if you take an industrial approach. And that's what's happening. The word agriculture comes from agrarian, meaning the soil, and culture, the enrichment of soil. Yet today, modern industrialized agriculture is a system that destroys soils, extracts soils, minerals, and degrades soils and erodes soils. We have lost touch with the natural systems of the culture of soil. Topsoil is the layer that allows plants to grow. 
and is decreasing at an alarming rate because of soil erosion. Most of the main crops of the world are eroding soils at 200 tonnes per acre per year. This cannot go on because topsoil is the basis of life on Earth. If we look at the present world as a species, we've lost touch with the natural systems. An industrialized agriculture goes against the laws of nature and we are not separate from nature. To find a solution, we have to look at nature and we have to build systems where humanity lives that is 70% forest cover because it's in the forests that we truly learn and it's the forests that help us to manage our soil's stability and enable that soil to maintain its fertility. The word permaculture comes from permanence and agriculture, but it naturally leads to permanence in culture. It's a system that focuses on solutions rather than problems. It's the art of working with natural systems to create productive ecosystems that provide all the basic needs of humanity. A design science that begins with ethics and mimics natural systems in any landscape, in any climate, anywhere on Earth. Permaculture is the way we go beyond sustainability and into resilience. When I started in permaculture, I was in my late 20s. I dreamt of being self-sufficient in my youth, but it didn't seem possible. But then when I arrived in Australia as an English immigrant, permaculture was a system that was just starting. It was just starting to be taught. And when I discovered it, a whole new light came on and all those dreams of the past came back to life and I realised this was a rational, common sense system that I could use as an approach to living in a more sustainable, natural, self-sufficient way. And that was a starting point for me. I was just a hard-working immigrant to Australia. Um, I'd worked as a, as a mechanical engineer, but I was working to do whatever I could to earn a living and permaculture was something that changed my, completely changed my view of the world and gave me something to aim for. Uh, since then, I, I started to work more and more on permaculture consultancy and design and developing my own systems. And people came to me and asked me to help them set up and eventually to teach. And then I was asked to teach overseas. And then I was asked to work, teach on aid projects. And eventually I was asked to manage the Permaculture Institute itself. I just kept getting pretty good results and, and creating very active students. And that led to more and more invitations to do more of the same. And that's what I've continued to do. And I, I still continue to try and teach better, get a better result, design better, consult better, be a better teacher. And, 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 and teach people to do the same. I really want my students to be better designers, consultants and teachers than I am. I studied under Bill Mollison, the founder of the system. Bill was born in Tasmania, in, in a, quite a, a rural coastal village. And he saw the forest come down. He, he saw the sea starting to be depleted. He saw the resources being lost right way back in the 1970s and he started to get concerned so he realizes that we need to come up with a system that would give us the supplies we need but also give us the solutions that are absolutely essential for permanent sustainable activity for humans to become the most beneficial element on Earth, rather than the most damaging system on Earth. Bill Mollison conceived the concept of permaculture as a design science and a subject that can be taught with clever little strategies of how it's extended worldwide and how 
Our, our students, once they've taken the course, can teach the course. And, and the word permaculture is owned by the students of the design certificate course. So it's more or less unstoppable. It's a wild system that can't be controlled because it's not centralized. Bill and I worked together teaching his last few courses. And um, that was a great honor to work with Bill um, as my teacher and then in the end of his career as his, as his co-teacher. And um, we're good mates, um, we're good mates. We always have been, we always will be. The biggest blunder that I've made along the way is hard to pick. Because <laughs> there's probably been a few. But <laughs> I think in the living system, it's the fact that I didn't pay enough attention to the exact climate I was working in in relation to the cycles of organic matter and the fast carbon pathways of um, succession from, from, from solar energy from the sun through the photosynthesis down to soil creation on the ground. How do I fast track this event to this event? Once I got that, that return of surplus energy through the plant mechanisms to the soil mechanisms, that was a big jump. And not just a big jump in physical action, but once I got that level of understanding, it was a big jump in confidence. I actually jumped in confidence. It was, it was a staging event. Once I was in there, it was like, once I got that, it was like learning to ride a bike. You're never going to forget. You can always ride. And I knew at that point, we'd, we'd, I'd, 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 I'd hit a milestone. But up until then, I was working so hard. I was working so hard. Green in the desert is a job that we took on in a very hostile situation. Um, in the lowest place on earth, the Dead Sea Valley. And uh, because it's such a hostile site, um, a result in a site like that really stands out. Um, where if you get a, a result in an area that's very lush, it doesn't necessarily stand out as being obvious. Um, plus, it's right in the Middle East, in, in a sort of geopolitical hotspot. So, um, Green in the Desert is just a small project because that's all you need actually. It's a little 10 acre project and um, we proved that we can get a result even in incredibly difficult situations and anybody on earth sees that as difficult and everybody recognises those sort of Middle Eastern locations that are so much in the news in recent history. The Jordan Permaculture Project that we're engaged with is in the Dead Sea Valley. It's the lowest place on Earth, 400 meters below sea level. So it's rather an unusual climate because at its latitude, it's actually in a Mediterranean region, but because of its lack of altitude, it's more of a subtropical temperature range with an extreme heat and dryness in summer. In this last year, Jordan has experienced one of the coldest winters on record and now one of the hottest summers on record. So this has been a real test case for our site. But what we have is 3,000 square meters of hard, harsh landscape. This is not the ideal site to settle. This is the site that we chose to set an example of what a lot of people have to live with in the sediments in the Dead Sea, which are a lot of westerly rocky slopes settled by what have been the refugee villages of Palestinians. Now this site has been a real challenge. Very little soil, enormous amounts of rock. So much rock we had to build rock wall, earth back, contour, swell, 
catchment systems to rehydrate the landscape when it does rain. Now the rains are very, very small. It's only 150 to 200 millimeters of rain a year. As usual in these hot, arid landscapes, it's crucial that you catch all the water you can and soak it all into the soils and the subsoils to avoid evaporation. This we've done to establish extremely hardy desert trees to give us extra anti-evaporation strategies of shade, wind buffering, and the production of pretty good nitrogen-rich mulch, because most of these trees are gonna be nitrogen-producing leguminous trees. That's how they survive. They're hardy pioneers. And we've had to be hardy pioneers as well to manage this site into a pioneering succession that's given us the ability to start to plant other trees and other crops. We started off with olives because they're one of the hardiest, then date palms, pomegranates, figs, um, some citrus, mulberry, carob. They're all there and we've increased the diversity of nitrogen rich support species as well. So we've even gone into more beneficial support as well as diversifying our food forest type assembly. It's a forest, desert forest garden, it's a food forest where we've been able to then move into crops, herbs, small animals, production of natural fertilizer, and we've positioned infrastructure that is designed to be an example of what can be copied locally, but it functions as an institute. So we have a house that doesn't have a kitchen because we need a large kitchen to cater for the students that come to learn. We have a separate kitchen. We have a separate bathroom and toilet complex, but we're demonstrating waterless toilets, compost toilets, and a shower block where we have male and female showers and large amount of showers and toilets, but our showers, our gray water, go to a biological cleaning system, run with reed beds, and the water is cleaned naturally with the roots of the reeds and can water fruit trees because it's cleaned up enough to be safe to use in the environment. It's not cleaned up enough to drink. You could go that far, but we don't have to. And we've positioned the main shower and toilet block and reed bed system high in the landscape so we can gravity water all through the project site. Now we've also even positioned a small reed bed made out of recycled materials just to run on the one kitchen sink. We're also demonstrating systems like wicking beds made from recyclable materials. We've got vegetable systems under shade rather than in polytunnels. We've got special formed vegetable beds that are sunken to reduce their water use and avoid evaporation under shade to extend crops over the year. We also have small animal systems for manure and natural fertilizer creation through compost. And we have roof gardens being established. We also have renewable energy systems. There's no shortage of sun. There's plenty of sun energy for hot water production, which is easy, hot enough almost to boil, a, boil your tea and your, and your boiling water in midsummer. And we have solar electricity and a grid switching system where we don't need a generator, but we can actually use the grid to charge our batteries or run extra electricity if we need to, but most of the time we can run on renewable energy systems. We even have specially designed buildings where we have our main house as a straw bale insulated on the sun and western side and mud brick on the east and northern side to bank the cool so we don't need air conditioners. These are all examples we've crammed into our site so that we can show local people that there are many facets to this system of permaculture design that they can take and realize these clever little systems all put together make life easier, even when you're on a westerly slope with lots of sun, rock, and poor soil conditions you can still make life a lot better. And if you extend this out into better country, you can do very well economically.
Hi, Jeff Lawton here, and I'm at the Green in the Desert site, the sequel. I'm gonna take you for a tour so you get a bit of a refresh on what we've been doing. We've got a real success with wicking beds. So we're making new wicking beds all the time for schools. And we had one of the driest summers on record. And here we are in autumn. It's just going into the cooler time of year, yet the site's been green. As soon as we arrived, it was green. It's been green all the way through winter. Our new nursery, which is about 12 months old now, is producing a real diversity of crops, perennials and trees, and it's continuously producing. At this time of year, we're getting ready for the winter season is when most vegetables are grown. And our crop garden here is just going into its winter crops. So this is gonna to start to become completely full of vegetables. A lot of it's just seedling at the moment. A perennial spinach, it's a salon spinach, that actually grew right through the summer and works as a continuous perennial spinach. This is a new main crop for Jordan as far as we can tell. So we're improving things as they prove their worth. So we've got a downhill chicken composting system where the compost is continuously turned downhill and comes out at the bottom here. So we have these doors that open and release the compost. Every week, one cubic meter pops out. One cubic meter of material goes in the top and comes through the system. This is the engine of the fertility of the site. We've built the rabbit system onto the other end of it. They were together, but they weren't connected. Now we have rabbit manure linked to chicken manure, linked to the compost and the fertility of the site. And this rabbit house, it's got baby mothers, mother and baby chickens in here too. This rabbit house is below ground. I'm already below ground and it's a lot cooler. And there's a hole here with about 30 rabbits down there. Our food forest now has a large production of olives. So we've pruned at this time of year and we've pruned all our olives and we've pruned all our support species, all our legume trees. And we've pulled off about five big sacks of olives, which will give us about 100 litres of oil in total. We have three very large pits of mulch and they're full of the spiky mulches that made up our first pioneer trees. And each week, we bring in a bag of manure and we push that manure down through the spiky mulch and water it, and it's breaking down into what I could only describe as almost rainforest soil. So we've got three huge pits of rainforest soil here. They're almost two meters deep and two meters wide. And next year, we'll be planting these and around these, but we're already seeing the trees around these pits are incredibly fertile. And the growth on the ground has been really fertile, even through the, the most hostile weather this summer. So the deep mulch spiky pits have been a real success and we intend to extend them. And they were just a convenient way to deposit the incredibly hostile spiky trees that we had to use as our initial pioneers. We've gone past that stage. So from here we can start to see the sun going down over Palestine. But our brand new grape trellis over the top of our roof garden of Wickham beds. And we're now influencing neighbours. So we have a neighbour across the road who's taken our permaculture design certificate course. Hi Abla! <laughs> and she's now starting to put little rock contour swales across her property. So we've actually jumped the road and we've got a permaculturist across the road and we've got people right next door working for us, welding up and making some of these trellises. We're employing the local community. And we're gonna turn this upstairs here into a very, very nice space with the grapevine over the top, the herbs and vegetables all the way around, maybe even carpets in here, and a nice seating area so that students can sit here and do their design exercises or just relax 
while they're taking a permaculture design certificate course. And this is one of my favourite views. When I look at the backdrop of the hills and I can see the landscape type that we started with and we've recycled all our water, we've created all our own fertiliser and we've got a, a, a food desert food forest canopy that's almost at an established stage, it's moving towards a maintenance stage. This is something that gives me hope for all the climates of the world that are this dry and this hostile. This is early morning in Kafrain in the Dead Sea Valley. And you can see it's a pretty rocky area. We're in a small settlement here above the agricultural land. We have quite degraded landscape, unless you've got lots of irrigation and fertilizer. Some of our students here, local family, they've started to use permaculture design and they've captured the water off the driveway and created a nice little food forest here. And that's just mostly running off that extra catchment and also when they clean up outside the house. And all this growth comes off that and a little bit of extra irrigation. But then this is what we've come here to see, is just here we've set a production system up and we've got vegetables growing very early in the season. Most people out in the fields haven't planted yet. And we've already got a crops up and the kids are running a lot of this. And on this side, we've got wicking beds in full production. Although it's right at the end of summer, we've got Salad mallow here, molahaya it's called here, growing in a wicking bed. We've got new wicking beds just about to be planted there, new crops going in. We've got crops at the end of summer here actually still producing, which is pretty special in this climate. And it's even more special when you realize how this was started. This is nothing but solid rock. So as I walk through, you'll see the chicken tractor on steroids at the other end, producing a cubic meter of compost almost every week. And we've got hardy local chickens. But all the way through here, there's about two to three meters of solid rock. I mean, literally pickaxe their way down to a level terrace here. So when you look over this way, you can see the rock that it was carved out of. And they're still cutting another terrace here. They've got room for another garden, but that's the starting ground. And they use the rock to build the retaining walls on the outside. All the way down here, we've got some hardy spiky legume trees and a few fruit trees in amongst it. And all the way through here, right down the edge, we've got climbing vines going up. We're gonna get it nicely shaded. There's a school next door looking straight down on this. But when you look over the edge, you can see the rock. This is the rock that carved out this system. This material came off this area where we've now got chicken and vegetable production. And what we also have is just next door. We have the neighbor starting their system. They're still hacking out the rock, but they're gonna put a system in too because they've seen the result. So. This is an extension of our design work of people we've trained and people we've helped because they've shown the enthusiasm and they've put in the work and we've helped them put in their water tanks. And now the kids in the school right next door are looking down on what could be a better future. For side, this is your garden. Uh, which one? All of yours? Um, and what's he growing? Uh, Chilies. Uh, tomato. Feed ginger. Uh, yeah. And what are you going to do with all this produce? You're going to extend the garden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you look after the chickens too? 
ليش ارجعوا من اول جديد عشان الكل بس ايش يفرد ثاني مره ويكون الزبل عشان ليش ويكون الزبل واضح عشان يرجع يفردوا كل ما يفردوا يدير ميه من الكون ونستفيد من الزبل اللي حنا لاول مره اه ذاتس يور فيرتلايزر يا Alright. Thanks, mate. Hello, Bihti. Thank you very much. Hi. Hello. 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 I'm here at Naima's garden again, and this is the chicken system. We've had a big storm. We had 42 millimeters of rain on our rain gauge, but I'm here to show you the amount of growth since I last filmed the garden. Now there's been a little bit of wind damage on this end, but we've got this much growth since we were last here. So uh, it's only been a month, and this is the first rain. Uh, this is all organic. The boys are growing this. One young son for each garden bed. It's got tomatoes coming on, quite nice corn there, uh, which is a heavy feeder. What do you think of that, and Estefan? It's amazing growth. Very, it very it is amazing growth yeah. considering it's on rock. Look at that corn cob coming up. That's quite a corn cob. And growing now on solid rock is all about feeding organically in this case, and it's feeding with this stuff. Chicken tractor system on steroids is my nickname for this. The mulch from under the roost has been manured on for a week. Equal amount of large animal manure, which in this case will be sheep and goat mostly. And then food scraps on the top, making more than a cubic meter. The chickens dissemble it and we put it back together every week. Five weeks later, we got the fertilizer to get something like that up and rolling. I did notice they've brought in some pigeons. So it looks like we're going to build a pigeon loft as well. But starting with that kind of rock, and there may be another garden up where that rock is later. What do you think of that, Adam? Amazing. <laughs> Three months, four months. <laughs> Look at that growth. <laughs> and the fertilizer's sitting right there and it comes out all the time. It goes straight into the system and then you have all the excess produce that's going straight back into the chickens. Plus we got eggs, plus we got some spare birds. He has the grapes coming here on the side, which eventually will be able to grow over the chicken coop and then in turn feed the chickens as well. So what do you think of that, girls? Quite yeah. unusual. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's impressive. impressive. Yeah, even the edges are so amazing, uh, abundant. What about, think about that, Louis, on, on solid rock? It's amazing. Three it's months. Completely amazing. That's the compost chicken tractor for you. It's hardly believable. What do you reckon? I can't believe it. I mean, how long did this take? This is three months from solid rock. Three months. And the rock was this side. It was up to your shoulder. They, 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 chip, uh, they, they yeah. chip the rock away. Yeah. Yeah. Naima, say hello. Everybody, everybody <laughs> thinks your garden is absolutely amazing. You should be really, really proud of it. All right? You should be famous. A quick view from the garden is this beautiful little food forest here. Nitro and Fixers on the end, their eldest son, is showing us what they do. They clean the car park here, they clean the parking area, they clean the seating area, they wash it off. But a byproduct of washing the garden is actually watering this little section of food forest. There's a marriage party tonight, so there's a, a few chairs piled up because there's going to be a few people here. Food scraps, they're going to go to the chickens. Cleaning water, it's going to go to this food forest. So we're really talking multifunction. And so we've got herbs on the ground, legumes all the way through it, great production on the papayas. That's a papaya anybody would be proud of. Here's uh, moringa. We've got penicetum soaking up the nutrient on the end here as well, which can be a great carbon mulch. Here's Mohammed. Naima and Mohammed are the ones who've done all this hard work, and it's a great testament of what can be done. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. In this course, we cover why you need to design, how you design, how you understand the patterning of systems around you, how you define your climate so you can design accurately within your climate. And, and we design with a climate in relation to energy cycles from the trees. We, we get you to understand how ecosystems give you production. We take you through water and how water works, how soil is created. We give you confidence in all those things. We teach you how to work with surveyors and do earthworks on the land. We teach you the energy efficiency of houses and how to design houses to be comfortable, 
how to deal with your waste systems, how to deal with how to design renewable energy systems, how to specifically work with plants and animals and supply lines, even, even aquaculture, how to work with production in the water itself. And we teach you how to work with community systems, financial systems, living, how you create your own living by design, which is beneficial for the environment. Mainframe design is where we just come down to the nuts and bolts of the system. How we look at water as a design, access as a, as a design, structural positions as a design, and then how we work out our energy efficiency through those systems, how we understand the weather in those systems, just the very basics, the mainframe, it's like the foundation. And then we can add on to that, we can add the details later. If we get the mainframe right, everything hangs together nicely. Connectivity in design gives us that synergy, it gives us that extra effect. By connecting things together, we get a resilience. We get a system that is incredibly durable. It will stand lots of variation. Connectivity allows us to survive all the variations that are particularly important at this point in history where we're getting lots of climate change, we've got lots of variations around us, things are constantly changing. Connectivity gives us that, that dynamic elasticity of strength. And it's most important, we're, we're very much a connecting system between disciplines. We're more about the connections than the disciplines themselves actually. It's an advantage not to be an expert in any of these fields because this is a fresh new approach of how to look at integrating knowledge. Rather than being a specialist in a field, it's better, be, better to be a generalist that understands the integration of all the relevant subjects so you can wrap it up together. And that's what makes a great designer. And that's what we teach you. We teach you to take on this new approach to knowledge. And that's what makes people so excited and passionate actually. You don't need to have a big block of land to do this. In fact, you don't need land at all. You can get access to land just out of your enthusiasm, your, your willingness to engage in a system. You can start from a balcony. You, you can start from a windowsill. It doesn't matter. Your enthusiasm will get you into the position where you, where you want to be. There we go, I'm going to see if I can get some fresh lunch. Got plenty of fish in here, like we have in all the aquaculture dams we've got on the property. And that's another subject. We've actually only just scratched the surface of permaculture here. We, we could delve a lot deeper. I'm going to take you through, in my next video, some really interesting locations where students of mine from all different walks of life, people who had approaches and, and professions and, and, and attitudes to growing systems where they hadn't really engaged before. They hadn't, hadn't had any experience. They weren't farmers. They weren't gardeners necessarily. And anybody's capable of creating incredible systems and achieving amazing results. And that's what's important. I just want you to achieve it quicker. Time is something you don't need to engage in with permaculture. Time is something that expands once you start to work with permaculture. You might think you don't have time. The truth is that when you engage in this subject, time expands and time is relative to your passion of engaging with the subject. And there won't be any time that you're not engaged. You'll be permanently engaged in this new thought process. So it's not relevant to even think about the fact that you won't have time. This is something you won't be able to stop thinking about and you'll love thinking about it. And that's what's so wonderful. You can watch permaculture videos and you can read the permaculture articles on the internet and in books, but it's not until you actually engage in the design process and someone takes you through all the framework 
and teaches you how to build the understanding of the subject, that you suddenly realize there's a transformational event that's taking place. You've changed in a way that you realize you have a positive way of seeing things and engaging in direct action. You know there are things you can do that are going to benefit not just yourself, your family, your community, but the whole world.